So in this video we're looking at the microscopic structure and the tissues of the lung. What we might call the lung parenchyma. And it's actually a very detailed intricate structure. Now it's interesting that butchers actually call lungs lights because they don't weigh very much. And the reason for this is that the lungs are more air than, than, than tissue. There's lots of little cavities in the lung. And these, of course, are the alveoli. In fact, alveoli is from the Latin for small cavity. And apparently in each lung there's about 480 million of these uh, alveoli. And that gives a huge internal surface area, about 70 square metres of internal surface area per lung over which gaseous exchange can take place. And each uh, alveolus, alveolus is singular, alveoli is plural, each alveolus is about 200 micrometers uh, in diameter. 200 micrometers. That's 200 thousandths of a meter. In other words, you could get five side by side and that would take up a millimeter. So 50 side by side would be a, would be a centimeter. And then when we've thought about the alveoli, we want to go and look at even more detail. We want to look at the respiratory membrane over which gaseous exchange takes place. This is absolutely vital, of course, because the oxygen has to diffuse down its diffusion gradient from the air in the alveoli into the blood. The carbon dioxide has to diffuse down its diffusion gradient where it's high in the blood down into the alveoli. And this process of gaseous exchange is taking place across the respiratory membrane. So absolutely fascinating complicated structure, even though the tissue on itself on a macroscopic level looks fairly simple. And in fact, this is how you, you get to know that you're starting to understand physiology because you, you have this sense of awe, th this amazement at the complexity of the structures that you're considering and the complexity of the physiology that those structures facilitate. So I've just started to draw my alveoli with these alveolar cells. Just drawing in the nuclei there, dark stained nucleus in each cell, of course. And these are called the type 1 alveolar cells or the type 1 pneumocytes. Pneumo means lungs, site means cells. And they're made of simple squamous epithelial cells. Now squamous means the cells look squashed or flattened. <laughs> they're not of course, they're, they're designed that way. So they're a simple squamous epithelium and these are the type 1 pneumocytes and these actually occupy 90 to 95 percent of the internal surface area of the lungs made up by these individual air cavities or little cavities. But there's actually another cell type in the walls of the alveoli as well. Uh, they're just in the walls the same as the type 1 pneumocytes are. They're much smaller. There's quite a lot of them. They've got a nucleus as well, of course. There's quite a lot of them, but they take up less, uh, less space because they're relatively small cells. And we see here they've got a wavy surface there. That's because the surface of these cells contains what we call microvilli, these small projections containing cytoplasm that increase the surface area of this individual cell. And this is a type 2 alveolar cell or a type 2 pneumocyte and they're also sometimes called septal cells. And what these cells do is they actually produce the alveolar fluid and these are part of the wall alongside, alongside the, um, the type 1 pneumocytes, which we see here. And the junction between all these cells in the alveolus are relatively tight junctions. The cells are quite close together because we don't want too much transfer of fluid between these. Now, these type 2 cells are particularly interesting. Um, the alveolar cells, as we've said, because what they do is they produce alveolar fluid. Now, the oxygen cannot absorb, cannot diffuse into a dry surface. 
So the oxygen, of course, is going to be inside the air in the alveoli, and it needs to get through the type 1 pneumocytes to get into the blood. But it won't absorb into these cells if these cells are dry. So these type 2 pneumocytes, these septal cells, what they actually do is they produce and secrete from their microvilli because they have this large surface area to secrete from, the alveolar fluid. And it's this fluid that lines the surface, the internal surface of the alveoli. Absolutely essential or the oxygen could not diffuse in. So the oxygen can only diffuse into a moist surface. So this alveolar fluid produced by the type 2 cells is lining the alveoli. And as well as producing alveolar fluid, these are the cells that produce the surfactant or the surface active agent. And this contains a mixture of uh, phosphates and fats, so-called phospholipids, and it contains protein and fat, so-called uh, lipoproteins. And what the surfactant does is it reduces the surface tension all around the in the fluid that's lining the internal surface of the alveoli it reduces the surface tension and that's really important for two reasons first of all if the surface tension is less then the oxygen can diffuse into the alveolar fluid more readily to carry on its journey through the pneumocytes into the blood but also because the surface tension is reduced then these cells are less likely to stick to each other, the individual cells that comprise the different walls of the alveoli, and indeed the uh, small respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar bronchio bronchioles, the very small alveolar ducts. We don't want those sticking together. So we reduce the surface tension to stop them sticking together. So even if these uh, opposing cells here and here do come together, then they're not going to stick because there's no surface tension to hold them together. They can come apart quite easily. And this is really important because if the lungs collapse or an area of the lungs collapse, that's called atelectasis. So in atelectasis, we can get collapse of the alveoli and the microscopic airways. And of course, atelectasis is a pathological condition. And if the lungs are collapsed, then the, gassy, the gases can't get in and out, so we can't have gaseous exchange, so the lungs aren't going to work. Now, these type 2 pneumocytes that produce the surfactant, they start developing from about 26 weeks gestation. So when the baby's about 26 weeks gestation, they'll start getting some of these type 2 pneumocytes, some of these septal cells. But at 26 weeks, they will start producing some fluid, but they won't produce a significant amount of surfactant. They will produce tiny amounts, but not much surfactant. Because, of course, the, 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 the unborn baby, the fetus, is getting its oxygen supply from the mother's placenta. It doesn't need to breathe in its lungs. It can't. It's, it's in utero. But then from about 35 weeks gestation, these cells start producing relatively large amounts of surfactant in preparation for birth because as soon as baby's born they're going to need to breathe and after the first breath when they breathe out we don't want the lungs to stick together the small airways and the alveoli to stick together we don't want instant atelectasis as would happen if these cells hadn't produced the surfactant from about 35 weeks gestation so babies born after 35 weeks gestation don't usually have trouble with this uh, respiratory distress syndrome, but babies born earlier than that certainly do. So very important to have this reduced surface tension inside the alveoli for those two reasons. Now, of course, the alveolar pneumocytes, type 1 and type 2, don't sort of float in fresh air. All epithelial tissues have to be situated on a, on a basement membrane. They're held together by this basement membrane. They sit on this basement membrane. Fibrous type, type tissue.
And this basement membrane is also very important for the function of the alveoli. Because this basement membrane contains elastic fibres. So there's elastic fibres in here. And these elastic fibres will mean that the individual alveoli will come back down, there'll be elastic recoil in the individual alveoli. So they're going to inflate with inspiration, but we need them to deflate for expiration to blow the air out again, out of the alveoli, once we've derived some oxygen from it. So we have these elastic fibres. And the basement membrane of the pneumocytes, the alveolar cells, also contains some uh, collagen fibres to give it strength. So collagen is the body's main structural protein because we don't want these structures to be weak, we need them to be strong. So that's provided by the collagen fibres which are also in there. And as we've said, the diameter of these alveoli, when we, during expiration, the diameter is actually about 200 uh, micrometres. 200 micrometres. But then when, when we breathe in, they're going to expand because they can expand, of course, because they're, they're elastic, they can expand then the diameter will be somewhat greater than that. Now, it's vital, of course, that the oxygen can get into the blood. So we're going to need blood vessels, which are gonna be pretty handy, pretty close by. And of course they are. So next to the alveoli, we have the pulmonary capillaries. And the pulmonary capillary vascular endothelial cells, as you would expect, sit on a basement membrane. So in green there, we've got the basement membrane of the pulmonary capillaries. The vascular endothelial cells that comprise the pulmonary capillaries. And again, they've got a nucleus there. Again, we see these cells are very thin. So there we have the pulmonary capillary with the vascular endothelial cells in there. These are the individual vascular endothelial cells sitting on this basement membrane, the pulmonary capillary basement membrane. And of course, it's through these capillaries that the red cells pass. A lot of the pulmonary capillaries are actually very small. Red cells often need to squash down to, to get through them, the individual erythrocytes that are going to pick up the oxygen need to squash down to get through there. And there's actually lots of these, of course, because about 70% of the surface of the alveoli, the internal surface of the alveoli, is in contact with pulmonary capillaries. So there's a very large area of contact here. So about 70% of the internal surface is in contact with pulmonary capillaries. It's almost a complete wall of blood, really, to facilitate this process of gaseous exchange. Again, the red cell going through there. So they'd be situated all round. Complete. So if that's an individual um, alveolus, then there's a complete network of capillaries surrounding it, perfusing it with blood. Blood going in via the pulmonary artery, blood draining via the pulmonary veins. Now, sometimes, of course, the lungs are insulted and they're subject to damage and the uh, cells can be damaged. Now, these cells here, these, these uh, type 1 pneumocytes, the, uh, the, flat, the flat cells in the alveoli, the, uh, the squamous epithelial cells, if these are damaged, they don't regenerate effectively. These are not good regenerators. They don't mitotically divide, or at least not effectively. So if the cells are damaged in some way, it's necessary to repair the lung. And the lung is actually a very good regenerator. When the lungs are damaged, they can regenerate quite well. They're very good at dealing with individual insults. So like if you're in a fire and you get smoke uh, inhalation, the lungs can recover from that quite effectively. What they're not so good at is chronic exposure to smoke or chronic exposure to pollution. But what actually happens if there's damage to the lung is it's these type two cells, type two pneumocytes that divide. These are the mitotic cells. 
So if there's damage to the lung, these cells will divide. And once these cells have divided, they can differentiate into new type 2 pneumocytes, but they can also differentiate into type 1 pneumocytes. So really, these are kind of the, uh, the stem cells, if you like, of the, the stem cells of the, of the alveoli. Now, there's another type of cell associated with the alveoli and the respiratory bronchioles and the alveolar ducts. And these cells uh, can actually move around they can move around inside the airways, inside the alveoli and inside the, the small air airway passages. And these cells are actually called macrophages. Now macro means big and phage means to eat. They are macrophages. And these derive from monocytes in the blood that migrate into the tissues and they spend the rest of their life patrolling the tissues and they patrol the tissues looking for debris. So for example, if you breathe in some dust, these will phagocytose that dust. And of course, from time to time, bacteria get into the alveoli and they're phagocytosed and digested by these macrophages. So if you didn't have macrophages in your lung tissue at the moment, you may well have pneumonia because that they're keeping the internal surfaces and cavities of the lung sterile absolutely important job. But what these cells aren't so good at is they're not so good at breaking down smoke particles because the smoke particles are indi indigestible. The digestive enzymes can't break them down. So if smoke particles are inhaled and you get smoke particles in the lung, then the macrophages will phagocytose them the same as they would bacteria, but then they can't digest them and the smoke particles damage the lysozymes, the lysozymes inside the cytoplasm of the macrophages, which contain the digestive enzymes. And that means digestive enzymes are released into the alveoli. And those digestive enzymes will digest the cell walls of the, of the alveoli. And that results in a, a permanent, over time, that results in a permanent enlargement of the alveolar spaces with loss of surface area as cells are digested. And that is the disease state called emphysema. So here we have the individual alveolus, oxygen going in here. Now the oxygen of course needs to get from the air in the alveoli into the erythrocytes, into the red blood cells. So it needs to diffuse through the respiratory membrane. So the respiratory membrane is anything between the air in the alveolus there and the red blood cell. So now let's look at a little more detail at the nature of this respiratory membrane. And we'll use the same color coding that we've used on this diagram. So here we have the type one pneumocyte. And this is actually very thin, very thin walls in the type one pneumocyte. But there's a thicker bit in the middle and the thicker bit contains the nucleus. And we now know from electron microscope studies that the cell organelles, the functional components in the cytoplasm, are actually clustered around this thick area in, near the nucleus, the functional areas of the cell. And what that does is that, that leaves these long limbs, if you like, of the type 1 pneumocytes nice and thin so that the gaseous exchange can take place and actually the width of these from there to there is 25 nanometers 25 nanometers now there's a thousand nanometers in a micrometer and there's a thousand micrometers in a millimeter so that gives you some idea of the very small scale and of course as we've looked at before the inside lining of the alveolus is lined with alveolar fluid, which contains the surfactant because the oxygen won't diffuse into a, a dry surface. So we have that on the, uh, on the surface. So the oxygen first has to diffuse into the alveolar fluid, then it can diffuse through these very thin limbs on its way to the blood. Now, the next barrier that we're gonna come across, if you think about the other diagram, is the basement membrane of the alveoli themselves. Remember that contains collagen and elastic fibers. So the oxygen needs to diffuse through that. And then the next barrier 
is going to be the next barrier is going to be the basement membrane of the individual pulmonary capillary so the oxygen is going to need to get through there as well the basement membrane of the individual pulmonary capillary and inside here we're going to have our uh, vascular endothelial cells again th these cells are very thin exactly for this reason of not giving the oxygen a long way to go to get into the blood not giving the carbon dioxide a long way to get from the blood into the alveoli and these are going to contain the red blood cells the erythrocytes many pulmonary capillaries are very small the cells have to deform and squash down to get through so there's the biconcaved disc of the erythrocytes darker color on the outside lighter color on the inside so this area here is the respiratory membrane. So the respiratory membrane is that box there. It is the path the oxygen has to take to get from the alveoli into the blood. It's the path the carbon dioxide has to take to get from the blood back into the alveoli. So the oxygen is diffusing down its diffusion gradient from the air into the blood. The carbon dioxide is diffusing down its diffusion gradient from the blood to get back into the air. And diffusion is the tendency for substances to intermingle until their concentrations become equal throughout. The system is always here, what it's trying to do all the time is equalize the amount of oxygen there and there. So diffusion will take place to equalize the concentration. But of course, as soon as you've done that, this red blood cell has moved away and it's replaced by another reduced or another red cell containing reduced hemoglobin. So the diffusion gradient is maintained by the, by the circulation of the blood. And likewise, the carbon dioxide here is trying to equalize the concentration between the carbon dioxide in the blood and the carbon dioxide in the, in the alveolar airspace. But of course it can never do it because this is always being topped up as you breathe in and you breathe out and exhale the carbon dioxide. So what we've actually drawn on this diagram it is kind of a blow up of what we had on this one. We're actually looking at this, at this area here in more detail. The respiratory membrane, absolutely essential for this process of gaseous exchange.